Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Today's episode is with Sam Henderson, who, uh, if you are in financial advice, would be familiar with him as, in a lot of ways, he was patient zero to the Royal Commission in terms of he probably felt more acutely the shame and blame that was handed down to financial planners more than anyone else in Australia. Um, This happened about 18 months ago, and he's on today to talk about what it was like to go through, now what his life is like afterwards, and his journey of going through that process of being responsible for what happened, uh, and also to start sharing a message with advisors to say, it's okay to be a financial planner, and you shouldn't be ashamed of it. So it's a pretty intense conversation at times, um, but hopefully you get something out of it. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor. And um, one of the most interesting conversations I could possibly imagine is with a buddy of mine, Sam Henderson. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, mate. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, Clayton. This is probably the first time I've spoken since the Royal Commission. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to to sit down and have a bit of a chat with you, buddy. Hopefully, we can add some value to some of the advisors listening here today. Um, there's probably a fair bit of insight I hope I can add to their lives, both inside and outside of advice. And that's really one of the reasons why I wanted to do this with you, mate. No, look, a massive um, thank you, I guess, because... It's going to be hard for anyone to understand, and I can't fully fathom it, to be patient zero for advisors in the Royal Commission. Um, And it's kind of weird because way before Royal Commission was even a term that people were, were, you know, silently whispering to each other before it came a reality, we caught up uh, as as we were at the time and uh, you were telling me about this problem case that you that you had, um, and we were going through it. And you were saying, you know, this is this is where some things went awry. This is where I could have done things better, and this is where things are probably getting blown out of proportion. Hmm. And I sort of remember having that conversation. And then fast forwarding, maybe it was about twelve months or eighteen months or something like that. And then watching you, because I watched it live on tv you sitting on the stand and then going okay well they're asking a set of questions that is leading to a particular uh, answer that they've sort of decided that they wanted to arrive at but a lot of the uh nuances to like any complex thing has Mm -hmm. and they weren't really allowing for those nuances to come up but thankfully sort of at the end your lawyer sort of jumped up and said, hey, this, 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 and this. Mm. And because I had known about this prior to the Royal Commission and then I watched the Royal Commission live because I knew you were going to be on it, half expecting you to faint. No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I stood my ground. Yes. Um, So I wanted to just really quickly go through the things that were, I guess, flagged as a part of that Royal Commission journey and then kind of go through it with you, and then you've got an ASIC document in front of you, and hopefully we can go through that as well. How's that sound? Yeah, I thought I'd bring the banding order so you can actually see what it looks like. It's a fascinating document. Hopefully no one out there is going to see one, but uh, no doubt there's going to be a few people walking around with these in their hand and wondering what the heck it all means. And uh, I think there's probably some learnings for other advisors in all of this. And uh, you know, the other learning, of course, is to understand that the Royal Commission was around building a narrative uh, towards the industry uh, to bring about change. And that's really what it was about. The Royal Commission is not a full investigation. It was really a, uh, a way to bring about change to an industry that was probably due for some change. Uh, we could probably argue whether it was done in a constructive 
way uh, or whether it was just done with a cricket bat, <clears throat> which is the way really they want to do it. It's a bunch of lawyers running a, an investigation or a, uh, um, uh, I suppose it is an investigation at the end of the day. So listen, the, the, I think importantly, uh, it, it's a narrative, like listen, everyone's been through some bad times in their life. And I think you've got to understand that um, one group of people will develop a narrative about you and you've obviously got your own narrative about you, how you like to see things. And Brene Brown says uh, that everyone's trying to do their best. And I would like to think that I've always been trying to do my best. I've always been an advocate for the industry. I've got absolutely nothing to gain from it sitting here right now. I'm not in the industry. I'm not an advisor. I don't want to be an advisor. Um, so I've got no no other agenda right now apart from really trying to comment as objectively as I can about what happened, but also uh, to give you some subjectivity around uh, around the, the goings-on of both the Royal Commission and also uh, for me as an advisor. And, you know, frankly, I worked my butt off for the industry. I worked uh, to advocate the FPA, the AFA and the SMSFA uh, and to advocate uh, for people to go and seek advice, to get advice and to try to better their lives from their experience with their financial advisors. And I can hand on heart say that the vast, vast majority of if not all financial advisors think they're doing the right thing by their clients and this is a relationship business right we are not lawyers and to put a bunch of advisors and bureaucrats in front of the country's best lawyers who are teamed up to produce a narrative to create change is always going to be a losing battle. So we need to understand that. And then on the flip side, we've got this public opinion around the banks and financial services industry that plays perfectly into the tall poppy syndrome. They want to bring everybody else down to their level. And we can understand why we, you know, that there's, there's banks earning, you know, Five billion, ten billion, twenty-five billion dollars uh, profit uh, every half year. Like it's an extreme amount of money, and the vast majority of the public are paying the fees and the interest differentials on their on their loans to fund that. So that's why they're asking questions. Just about every super fund in the country has bank shares. So we can understand why that level of scrutiny um, uh, is is present. I think the sad part is that. The people that appear, you know, let's just take me out of the equation. These are human beings, right? So whether you're looking at the head of CBA, the head of Westpac, Brian Hartley got carded the other day. Um, the, these are human beings that are generally, you know, if we use the Brene Brown uh, sense of the words, uh, trying to do their best. And Brian Hartz have brought some great change around for Westpac. They've had some really positive initiatives. Um, but at the end of the day, he had to take the fall. And as a leader, really, you got to take the fall. The first book I read after the Royal Commission, uh, in fact, was Jocko Willing's book, Extreme Ownership, because while wow. I was laying face down on the canvas, again, a Brene Brown book uh, expression, while I was laying face down on the canvas, um, I was asking myself, rather than thinking, oh, poor me, poor me, what have I done to bring this about? Okay, so I was part of the media. Uh, you know, I was, I was commenting on a regular basis. Uh, I was... I would never describe myself as a celebrity, you know, this whole celebrity financial planner thing. That's, that's just headlines. That's absolutely ridiculous to even think that as I'm sitting here in shorts and a t-shirt and, uh, you know, you know me, I'm a pretty casual sort of guy and, yeah. uh, probably a little bit too casual, which is probably what led me to, uh, to being there in the first place. But, you know, our business is about relationships and, uh, I've always thought if you say something to somebody, uh, then, then it's true. It's as good as having it written. It's like a handshake. <clears throat> so, you know, if I say, Hey, this advice is draft advice. It's draft advice. But that's not how it works in legal circles. If you say it's a draft advice, it's not because your staff member produced it with sign here stickers on it, then it is what it is. And I've got to own that. Um, I probably didn't check my documentation like I should have. I could have been much more thorough. I was out there doing other things, building relationships, and I didn't pay enough attention to the documentation. So if you're an advisor out there that hasn't, um, but, well, frankly, if, if I was advising now, I would literally read the Corporations Act and I'd get an understanding of what that means for me and for my business. And don't think that if you're part of a dealer group or an association that they're going to step in and help you because they're not. It, it, more than anything, they'll probably ostracize you. They'll probably push you away because uh, you will be poisonous. You are toxic. Uh, and that's certainly been the experience that I had. So most of the people that were close push me away because I was toxic and I completely understand why they would do that. They had to. And it's again, one of the reasons why as an owner, uh, and as a, um, you know, as a business owner, but also as a leader, you got to take ownership and responsibility for what you're doing. Uh, there's been too many people in there saying, Hey, you know, we tried, we tried, but you know, we're, we're innocent, we're victims. Bullshit. 
We're not innocent victims. We're out there running our businesses and trying to make money and do what we need to do. But at the end of the day, we're going to take ownership for what we do. And I take ownership for my experience and for my uh, my participation in the Royal Commission. I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> but I call it the gift of the Royal Commission now. I think it's it's brought about some changes in my life that have been incredible. Uh, it's brought about a level of compassion and a level of uh, helping others that I never thought was possible because I was face down on the canvas. Before I get to that, though, uh, you were going to... Um, just clarify some of the, the issues around the Royal Commission and I'll, I'll step in on that. But, you know, one of the things that was, um, it was almost amusing. It wasn't amusing because I was lying down on the canvas with my face pressed against the floor at the time. But, you know, to be accused of uh, directing a staff member to impersonate a client almost seems laughable because it just didn't happen. It was never actually investigated from my side. It was never questioned. So it's it. not in that document. That's no, it's from, not a, it's no, from, from ASIC. No, I, I was never questioned on it. So I, I, I never directed anyone to impersonate a client. That's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but certainly if you read what's online, you know, written on the AFR or the Sydney Morning Herald or Australian or whatever it was, um, it was described as fact, but it didn't happen. Um, you know, even the master's degree in the, in, in the banning order that we've got here, uh, was put down to a cut and paste issue by another staff member. But by the same token, I've got to own the fact that that was in there and in no way am I going to deny the fact that it was in there and that I should have read it and I should have had it taken out if it was in there. When I wrote it, I had the words in progress in there. Um, and, you know, we can see here in the in the banning order, it says that they uh, ask to accept my explanation as to how the statement may have been inserted and uh, do not find there was any dishonesty on Mr. Henderson's part. Um, so, you know, I suppose it's important to just sort of clarify uh, the other factor around the conflict of interest in there as well. So they said because I own shares in um, MGP managed accounts that I should have disclosed that, and I did disclose it in our 2016 update. Um, but the shares came online in 2014, and I didn't update the FSG, which, frankly, looking back, you know, <laughs> retrospect's a powerful tool. But how dumb is that? Um, you know, it's the it's the number one document that we should be updating, not to mention the fact that, you know, my staff actually handed out an older version of the FSG, which is how it got in the client's hands in the first place. So we had one sitting there. We had different versions of the FSG sitting on the desk because they'd been sitting there for quite some time. You know, those sorts of uh, errors, mistakes, man, it sucks to be human. It really does. It sucks to be human. But we got to own it, you know? I mean, okay, but there's levels of ownership and, um, and I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, so let's, let's, in, in regards to, um, the third, uh, the access to third party authority, right? So as your lawyer at the end rightfully said, did you have a signed third party authority form? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah. So the answer, so you had it. So every single advisor out there goes, oh, Oh, yeah, good so point. Had, I didn't you, even think about you explaining had, that. You had a third party authority, right? So then, uh, and, and as every advisor out there is aware, um, sometimes on occasion, individual super funds choose to not abide by the Corpse Act themselves and refuse the third party authority because it's mm. not on a form with their letterhead <clears throat> on it, right? There isn't actually, as far as I'm aware, there's not actually a, a, an addendum to any of these third party agencies to become an agent, which says in order to be an accepted agent, you need a form filled out with our logo at the top. So um, from my understanding, your staff submitted the third party authority. It was rejected. The staff member then went, go fuck yourself. I'm just going to pretend I'm the person to get the detail. Is that what happened? I assume that that's what happened. Again, yep. you know, I was not party to sure. exactly what yep. happened. Yep. Um, the question at the Royal Commission was, did you direct your staff member to make the call? Yeah. Of course. I said, go and check the client super fund. <laughs> yes. As I didn't say, normal hey, go, co- normal course of go business. and check the client super fund and make sure you impersonate the client on the way through. Totally. totally. No, those words did not leave my lips. And, um, and, and to be very fair, to be very clear, if the company had accepted the legally binding document, then your staff member would have been operating 100% within the law. I would imagine so. I mean, still, you know, that staff member 
should not have done what she I'm did. Not excusing, no way do I I'm not excusing, that. but I'm, I'm just saying What, what I can tell you is that the number of people that have told me that that's common practice or was common practice, certainly wouldn't be right now, um, is phenomenal. And it's most certainly the wrong thing to do. It's 100% but, the wrong thing to do. But at the same time, there needs to be an accepted uh, amount of responsibility from a company that says, we don't accept something without our logo at the top. Hmm. Well, uh, then... Okay, so next time that happens, is there going to be a royal commission into why uh, third-party agencies can't access without logos? Come on, so mm. so 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 that's one thing, and and no one's defending the behaviour of the staff member. But I just these are the things that I think. Yeah, about, yeah. Right? Listen, mate, I think there's there's two sides to this, and you know, there's there's going to be people listening to this saying, hey, you know, I've I've heard of those things, and those things have certainly occurred in the past. Um, but these things cannot occur in the future. So if you're listening to this, my my advice to you is read the Corps Act. Don't rely on your your compliance people because I had compliance people. I had an external para planner. Um, you know, I I should have gone through the documents in much more detail than I did, and I've obviously been pinged for that, and I've lost my career. And um, uh, you know that that the lesson is to not rely on others and take ownership of what you're doing because this is going to affect your career. I get what you're saying. Yes, it, it's a hairline thing. You're relying on other people to to Absolutely. put their logo on it. And yes, it's going to piss us all off because they haven't done that. But you know, at the end of the day, what you're going to have to do is put back your client appointment and say, sure. "Sorry, man, we're having trouble getting the uh, getting this and through." That, that's the and best. This is how it's going to happen, right? That's but, the best way to view it as an yeah, outcome. Yeah. I agree. Which is ultimately okay. You put back the client, you, and then you, you get dragged into the regulator for saying you don't produce your advice fast enough. So listen, you get, <laughs> either way, you're going to get you're going to get screwed over. But uh, you know, this is the challenge that we had in in putting the stop sign here stickers on the advice is that we went to Foz for a complaint a few years back. We only had a couple, and uh, they said you need to implement your advice faster. So you should have Jesus. the stickers ready to go. So that was my argument in the in the commission. But by the same token, you know, I was not sure that the client had a deferred benefit versus a defined benefit. I thought it was a defined benefit. Um, and, you know, in my mind, there's no way she's ever going to lose money on it either because I, there's actually a recording of me to the super fund, which they didn't play, of course, uh, which said, hey, you've got a, a authority on file. I just want to clarify myself. My staff members rung in a few times. Um, is this a deferred or a defined? Can you please describe how the deferred works? But the client was sitting in the boardroom at the time, and I said to the people on the super fund, I've got this, I'll have to send this recording to you. Um, and uh, I said, oh, listen, I'm really sorry. I think I buggered it up. I think I thought it was a defined benefit. And if it was a defined benefit, I'd still back the advice today. Uh, the deferred benefit was expiring in about 12 months anyway. She was uh, attaining that uh, that age. And I most certainly would have thought a self-managed super fund would be appropriate as an alternative amongst others to that particular situation. So listen, this, that, that's how fine the line can be. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. Is it rough? Sure, it's rough. But made, you know, I, again, I got to take ownership of the situation. I, I, I'm glad that you're, you're owning the responsibility and the Jocko Willink uh, philosophy <laughs> and the whole thing. Like I'm a big fan of it and, and I am. But however, like for what you, for what went wrong compared to the outcomes is outrageous. Now, now I want to go into the meeting, right? So you go into the meeting. Now I'm going to tell you again, what my interpretation after watching you on the stand was, you walk in and uh, and you, you didn't look at the document, right? So you walk in and you go, um, oops, this is wrong. What we're going to do is we're going to refund you today. So we're going to refund any money that you've paid and we're not going to proceed with this advice. Did that happen? Yeah. Did you refund the money that day? Uh, as soon as was practically possible because I didn't have the bank details, but by the end of the week, I think I refunded it, yeah. Right. And so at this, uh, within a week of this meeting, not only is this potential client not out of pocket, zero dollars have been spent because there's a fee, it's been refunded because you've said you've made a mistake. And you said, this isn't the advice, this is wrong, refund, okay? But also, the advice is not going ahead. Hmm. So... That's the reality. Come on. I, th- I think the extremities of this case is what's probably blown me away the most because I, I got in trouble for describing it as a storm and a teacup because that's how I, that's that how is probably I view a very it. good description, which I, I'm um, sure you can't report. I, 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 but that's how it looks. I can't, but that's how it started. But you know, hey, it's the old butterfly flapping its wings in the forest, turning into a tornado sort of scenario. 
Um, but because of the position that I was seen to be in, you know, the sure. perceived position, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, as a as a leader, I suppose in the industry, uh, I I was treated differently. But also, I, I'm not trying to say I'm a victim in any way, shape, or form. No, no. Is about. Um, but. Uh, it was just dealt with in a completely different way, but it, it was also a perfect storm. So storm in a teacup, it was a perfect storm because hey, I was, you know, I was uh, hosting a TV show at the time, and you know, mate, this is cable TV. This is on Sky News Business. It's not like we're, uh, you know, Carl on uh, on the Today Show. And uh, you know, I uh, I just shake my head when I I see the term celebrity used because is that the first time you've ever been called that? Yeah, it actually is. <laughs> apart from my mates being dickheads, yeah, exactly, you know, out, out having a few beers, but. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it was, it was a hell of a shock. And I suppose because I'd never seen myself in that position, I was surprised that other people would accuse me of either being a celebrity, which is, it's actually a negative connotation, not yeah, a positive yeah, one. Yeah. Um, but if you look at what's popular in the news these days, it's all celebrity stuff. So that's why the headline is what it is. And that's the reality is. It metaphor, just seems like but, you got strung um, up for a mistake that had no consequences. Mate, the, the most difficult thing is we're all human, right? So this is a point I wanted to make around this entire podcast because the level of shame that I had around this blew me away. Cause I've always been a really positive person. I've never had depression. Uh, I've never been down, but what got me was the. Uh, the level of shame that I was carrying around, even to do this podcast. Here we are, eighteen months later, man. It's taken me a while to sort of get off the canvas and, and um, you know, uh, create the gumption to to get here and talk about this. But um, the level of shame that I had is now permeating throughout the industry. And there's a statistic that I saw uh, the other day, and um, uh, I, I'm still waiting for backup on it. But this particular industry leader said that there'd been 19 suicides in financial planning in the last nine months yeah that made me get up off the canvas jump to my feet and put my hands to my face and go let's fight this motherfucker because shame is a horrible thing we can't carry this shame around and one of the things that annoys me about this entire thing and not just my experience but Society in, a gen- in general as to where we are, we're, we're in a name and shame game and we've got everybody got named and shamed at the Royal Commission. Everybody. ASIC got hammered. FPA got hammered. All the banks got hammered. The little guys got hammered. Everyone got hammered. So everyone's ducking for cover and trying to cover their ass. Yet everyone should be coming together in a collaborative form and saying, hey, guys, we have a problem. How do we write an SOA? How do we make sure that the disclosure is such that clients are going to feel comfortable in proceeding with the investments here so we can go and give advice to the millions of people that need it and so desperately want it? And and how can we help those advisors, the bank advisors and the individual advisors and the industry participants to create an industry that is professional, but it is client focused, but isn't turning on itself and fighting? Um what people don't realize is that ASIC is purely there to enforce the law. They're not there to educate advisors. But wouldn't it be interesting if they weren't? Wouldn't it be interesting if if there was a body that could come together and we could all sit down and have a chat and go, hey, we've got a problem, but we've also got this massive demand for positive financial advice in this country. Most people are trying to do the right thing, as I believe truly I was. Um, so what's that going to look like and how to create that situation? I don't think it's that freaking hard. I really don't. I, if everyone sat down in a room and sorted it out, we'd probably have this thing sorted in 28 days or less. I thought you were going to say 28 minutes. No. <laughs> 28, well, I think we could probably do it in 28 days. 28 <laughs> minutes might be a little ambitious. Um, but that's what annoys me the most is that there's just other ways to go about things. And I think we can do it in a far less, um, in a way with as, you know, as little friction as possible, but in a collaborative fashion. That's, that's probably what bothers me the most. What what do you think is getting in the road of that? Uh, or bureaucrats. I saw a great um, uh, definition of entrepreneurs the other day. An entrepreneur creates productivity in the economy. Bureaucrats slow it down. Um, <laughs> and I, I truly believe that. Bureaucrats and, you know, industry, a lot of industry leaders, some of the associations, um, you know, they, these are not advisors leading these associations, these these are bureaucrats and, uh, you know, that the way they engage with the government, how they talk and the way the government engages, you know, that the government turns over, uh, 
so frequently in this country and the ministers, they have actually no idea because they go from one portfolio to the next and they don't have any expertise in the, in the space. So what you probably do need is someone to step in and be proactive and and a group of people because we've got different different industry bodies we've got associations we've got advisors we've got independent advisors we've got different associations we've got different um, regulatory bodies as well now which makes things even more confusing for the poor advisor and for the poor client god damn it the, the client picks up a 60 page document and they go what do you want me to do with this and the advisor says, well, I've got to tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't proceed with the advice in there. <laughs> and then if you decide to proceed, you need to sign the authority to proceed and we're going to go ahead and proceed. So do you want to proceed? And the client sits there going, what You're just giving me every the reason why not about? to. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, but we both understand why, why, like the purpose behind that, right? It's, and, and where the amount of, tr- the amount of trouble that advisors have created for uh, other clients in the past that have happened, right? And so you've got sure. these people that are sitting around a table and they go, right, Storm Financial happened. What do we do to make sure that does not happen again? Mm. Understandably, right? So I totally get that. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm super for capitalism and entrepreneurship and all that sort of stuff. And I'm, I, a part of me goes, yeah, because capitalists get it wrong. Mm. Or, uh, and so I got, I got no problem. Oh, absolutely. With, yeah, absolutely. I got, I got, and that, I think that's a really good point to make. It, <laughs> you know, you, you look at a, a liberal government, you wonder why they can't also look after the uh, uh, after the economy and education at the same time. You know, why yeah. can't we have a government that, that can do all of that? Yeah, exactly. Like it fascinates me. And, and, and so, and so the bureaucrats they do slow it down, and and I understand the reason why. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a, like Agreed. a lot, a lot of this stuff, it's like yeah, it, everyone agrees with your premise. It's just the conclusions perhaps aren't exactly where, and oftentimes when I talk to the, the, the bureaucratic people, they, the outcomes that do come out of their desires and, and what they were aiming to do, I, I don't even think they like, right? So, so. I completely agree, mate. Yeah. And, the, and this was interesting if I, you know, if I look down at the banning order sitting in front of me right now, um, when I got this banning order, it was the first time after six investigations that I looked and I thought, that's reasonably fair. Yeah. There's had- a few things in there that I probably would say, oh, yeah, but, you know, this and that. Yeah. But it's reasonably fair. So uh, what I ended up getting banned for was um, best interest, right? So we did, you know, it says in here, despite uh, evidence of uh, detailed analysis in most areas, there were parts as highlighted that showed the advice failed to record appropriate analysis. That's what you get done for now. And and I ended up getting banned for three years. Um, that's the minimum that you can get for best interest. So three to 10 years is what it says at the end. You, so I could have got banned for three to 10 years um, because I took ownership of it. And, you know, I owned up and pointed out a lot of the issues. I ended up getting three years. So to clarify, nothing to do with uh, the staff member, nothing to do with the um, the qualification. In fact, it says they're repeated repetitively. And I actually said, wow, who's the reasonable person there that, that did this? Um, consistently says uh, was not purposefully misleading or, mm. or dishonest. So all of that sort of headline stuff, irrelevant, um, which which mm. we did speak, speak about earlier. So does it come down to this? Does it come down to your holdings of managed accounts, which was uh, less than 1% of the company, and, and so it had nothing to do with that? No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. No, this is all about the uh, best interest duty. So where did um, it go wrong? Well, I mean, because best interest I is, like a, is a very broad term. So what? What? Well, let me read this to you. So while I agree that the advice did show detailed analysis in most areas, there were some parts, as highlighted, that showed the advice failed to record appropriate analysis and provide reasoning to support the recommendations. That's what Wait, it comes this, down to. The advice that we said. So this was is around not going um, to get implemented. Uh, this is for the there were two advice. advices that they looked at. So one, uh, and they were both similar. So despite the fact that we had included some reasons why they should consider uh, our products versus their existing products, the analysis was not detailed enough, uh, and it failed to record uh, either uh, reasoning, provide reasoning to support those recommendations. So Understood. it said, despite there were some, they might have been generic, um, they were not detailed enough. And, you know, when I look at what's happening out there, 
uh, we pretty much anyone that's getting investigated. We just saw the industry super funds get hammered the other day for it, 51% of advice non-compliant. Um, you know, it's a really fine line, and I think that's that's a harsh thing. It's a harsh reality about where we're at. You know, to say, hey, industry super, I think it was industry super funds, they said 51% of advice is not compliant. Um, yeah, it's pretty harsh because, you know, they'll be splitting hairs around things just like that, and that's the sort of stuff that we need to own. Um, so what do you do? Do you have a moratorium? Do you draw a line in the sand and go, hey, you know, there might be these instances where uh, that we need to disclose, and that's what a lot of the banks are doing with their remedial advice and, you know, the thousand lawyers they're hiring at the moment to uh, to go through all the advice for the last seven, eight, ten years, whatever. You know, we're seeing it with AMP using a 10-year look back on, on the compliance of some of their uh, their advisors that are, um, you know, looking at uh, the bowler issues. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere. And I think this is, again, the sad part is that the industry is now starting to turn on itself. I've seen a little bit of it on, on LinkedIn and someone made a comment the other day about me um, um, coming into the next FPA conference and talking about how to impersonate your client. Um, so I did say, hey, buddy, get your facts straight. But uh, And that person actually apologised and that it was very gracious of them to do so because, you know, there, there's there's a lot of sympathy, but there's also... Uh, you know, people are throwing stones and when there's adversity, some people will get up and try to fight each other and others will all stand on the same side and try to fight together. We're much better trying to fight together, but also much better engaging in discussion rather than trying to fight. Uh, and that's what I would like to see our associations doing or your associations doing. It's not mine anymore, thank God. Um, but, you know, FPA, AFA, SMFA, SFA and the Independent Financial Advisors uh, Association, they should be engaging with each other, ideally, and they should be engaging with the government and with ASIC in the in the most uh, proactive way possible. And if they need to say, hey, guys, pull your head in, let's do this, then that's what they need to be doing. But if you've got a bunch of um, sycophantic bureaucrats at the heads of some of those associations, uh, then that's not going to happen. And uh, I think that would be a sad place to be. How did you feel on that stand? Thirsty. <laughs> I was there for about four hours. Um, oh. I was fine for the first hour and a half. Uh, sorry, probably two and a half hours. But uh, as you know, I'm like a squirrel. I need to eat about every hour and a half at least. So um, I was feeling a little peckish. Um, to be honest, I was feeling fine for most of it. Uh, you know, you've just got to you just got to go through the motions. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can control. You're at the mercy of other people. Um, you really are a turtle on its back, and you. You're also, you're a negative voice. They are using your answers against you no matter which way you've, you're going to go. Uh, and it's never going to be a winning scenario. So it's a very uh, gracious, merciful sort of a, a process. You've just got to lie back and take it, so to speak. Um, and it's... It, it, by the same token, I suppose it's very grounding. It's uh, it, it's very human. It makes you feel very human and very uh, uh, well. Yeah, I mean it's, it's very challenging. But I, I think afterwards was the worst. Seeing the seeing the headlines was probably the worst thing, and understanding the impact that that might have on my friends and family. Um, Did they, they support you, mate? The level of support was mind blowing. I mean, hundreds hundreds of messages if not thousands wow um and yeah i mean it makes me emotional thinking about it right now but that gave me a lot of strength through that challenging time uh and none of us are prepared for that none of us so again that's that very human moment where it's, it's almost you're like in the spotlight you're getting you're literally like getting st like strung up and stoned in public um so yeah, it's 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 really challenging. It's uh, it required uh, a lot of strength to get back up from that, uh, and I became very introspective. I went and did a men's retreat like three days after, uh, and that was incredible. Um, I read a lot of books. Um, yeah, I, I just did a lot of introspective work on myself because. And and going back to that, the ownership piece again, which like I'm a big fan of. Um, however. People make mistakes as in, mm. sure, you, sh they're, they're, you you can look back and you say, okay, I got done for uh, not doing something in the best interest of my clients. And the reason why that happened is because I did not look at the advice well enough before the meeting. 
uh, even though we refunded it and insisted that it wasn't going to be uh, implemented, mm. you were charged as if it was going to be implemented. So um, there are mistakes and then there are sort of like punishments for mistakes. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've spent a fair bit of my life in advice now and I see mistakes on the regular. And what what really sort of blew my mind a little bit about this is a mistake had been made and yet it cost like – your your mental health in dollars because I know you're in the process of selling a business. The if the the magnitude of the effect of those mistakes, I I just don't think people ever experience that. It, 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 like mistakes happen. And but you mate, this is the gift. Coast. So I I call it the gift of the royal commission. So there's this. Um, uh, let's just say there's this guy in the US as part of this networking group that I've been part of, part of the Genius and Genius X group. And his name is Sean Stevenson. He's three foot, was three foot high, sadly passed away three or four months ago in August. And um, he was wheelchair bound. He was three feet tall. He had a, a, a congenital disease. And uh, if he fell over, he'd, he'd break his bones. He actually fell out of his wheelchair and passed away. Um, but what he used to say is also a psychologist and a public speaker. He said, this happened for me. He didn't say this happened to me. He said, this happened for me. And I suppose, in a way, the way I like to look at it philosophically is the reason why I've got broad shoulders is because I want to get up and I want to teach other people what it's like to get through this and through other things. Like with men's suicide is phenomenal, anxiety, depression, um, you know, what I've been doing is, is I'm, I'm out there feeding the homeless. I'm, I'm helping people. Feels good. Feels much better than sitting around feeling sorry for yourself. So that's the strength that it's given me, I suppose. On the flip side, it's given me purpose. It's given me focus. Uh, and it's given me an opportunity to give back in a way that I didn't think was possible. And I'd been searching for that for a long time. I didn't know what that would look and feel like. Man. So it's be- fascinating. It, it, because... Honestly, most people go through their entire life and never receive the full weight of a le- of of the legal repercussions of a of of what is clearly a mistake, right? I thought I was going to jail. I honestly no thought I was going to jail. I was prepared for 2 to 3 years. Is that why I started CrossFit? Totally. That's why I started hanging out in some bad areas and learning how to fight. Totally. Pretty sure there's a movie on that with Will Ferrell in it, but um, which I probably watched about five times. Uh, Maybe just putting it out there. Uh, (laughs) It's a good going away. Yeah, it's hilarious. Um, Mate, I honestly thought I was going to jail. I didn't understand what I. I honestly didn't understand what I'd done. There was a moment when I was standing in the shower. Tears streaming out of my eyes and I'm pounding on the wall going, what have I done? What have I done? And I was half out asking the question, what have I actually done? Yeah, but, you know, what could possibly happen? Because I, I literally thought I was going to go to jail. And when, you, when you're thinking like that, that does take you to the lowest of low. Certainly socially, that's, how, that's what we see as the low. Um, you know, so to get a three-year ban, I'm sort of like, that's great. And, and, and <laughs> as stupid as it sounds, is, were um, you the only advisor that that went like operating advisor that was on the stand? I don't know. Probably. I can't. I can't think of it. I mean, Terry McMaster, who was, uh, you know, potentially uh, seen as a yeah, an advisor. heads of dealer groups, there was heads of associations. So yeah, probably was. Yeah. I just I found it. I, I found it. To we only honest. had two advisors. So anyone that's out there thinking, hey, this is like a hundred staff place just because he had a TV no, show no, and no, looks like a wanker in a suit I, and whatever. That's not the way it is. I, I, we're a two advisor, small firm so, in the city of so Sydney. So how can a royal commission, the highest in our land of investigative, you know, procedure, um, which was a, a, a review into the misconduct of the banking and financial services industry, how could it land? on someone's desk with two advisors. I think the the narrative of a leading advisor doing the wrong thing, making a mistake, makes for a fantastic story. And But it, is the point of it to have a story it or is did. it the point of it to do an investigation? But I think the Royal Commission is about bringing about change and they'll do it any way, shape or form that they can. And they did. And frankly, they conducted themselves in a way that's brought about so much uh, conflict and change in the industry that now no one knows what to do with it. 
Um, so objective achieved, but you've also got to understand that this is a bunch of lawyers getting together for a party. I mean, this is their this is their feast. This is uh, this is what they do. This is their greatest moment in history, right? A royal commission is the greatest thing for the legal fraternity to get together uh, and and uh, and do what they do at the highest level. So go after the banks. Go after the the millions of dollars in in laundering that Mate, goes again, on. Yeah, go go, go that, after the stuff that everyone gonna, agrees with that should be yeah. absolutely the focus, not little old. Celebrity yeah, mate, that's, Sam. That's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna, that's gonna brand me the victim. I'm, I, I, I know, don't, I know. I'm not going down that path, no, no. mate. I, uh, I, I, fair I, enough. That was my pe- opinion. A on lot it. of people have said. A lot of people said, "Oh, was it a setup? Was it this or that?" Listen, it could have been anything. Who knows? But at the end of the day, it was what it was. Yeah. And to, again, to me, it was a gift. It's given me so much focus about what I want to do. I've I've been um, business coaching. I've been coaching people in the industry, which is fascinating. A lot of people have reached out to me. Um, you know, I made one comment on on LinkedIn the other day, and I've had I don't know umpteen messages, and it's just fascinating because a uh, I've built up an incredible amount of knowledge and intellectual property over the last 20 years about, you know, for being in the industry. Yeah. Um, I've seen the absolute highs. I've had my own TV show. I've written three best-selling books. You know, I've, I've had a highly successful award-winning business. I've also had the lowest of lows. I've been the front page news. I've been through a Royal Commission. How many business coaches can say, A, that they've actually had a success, but B, they've actually been through this sort of shit and come out the other side and seen it as a gift? And that's where I want to be. I want to, I want to contribute back, whether it's either free on a voluntary basis or whether it's on a commercial basis that I can charge for my coaching. I'm already doing it on a voluntary basis and I started doing that 12 months ago. I don't want any recognition for that. I don't want to talk about what I'm doing there in any great detail. I'm just doing it because I'm doing it yeah. and I don't really give a stuff. I'm never wearing a suit again or I probably won't wear a suit again. Um, I'm happy wearing board shorts and a T-shirt for what I do. Um, but you can't take away what's inside my head, and that's that's the gift that I've now got. No, 100%. And look, I I wanted to get across to you what my views were, and uh, and then take it and leave it. But let's let's get the focus off you for a is. moment, <laughs> because I know there's some other things that you want to talk about as well, which is the the industry as a whole, mm. and why the hell or, or or how advisors should be feeling about themselves. So what I see is. Um, I can't. I kind of see as uh, you got a bunch of professional services out there, and all of, like we we see ourselves as the ugly duckling at the moment, mm. and uh, and we're going through a lot of changes. And everyone, you know, everyone loves the 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 purpose of the changes, and then there's discussion around the implementation of those changes and what it means. And we can we can put all that to the side for a moment because. Uh, this industry is under a lot of shame at the moment. Mm. And again, as, 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 um, you know, bloody the center of where it all started, you were kind of the first person to strung up. You feel it probably more acutely than any, anyone else. How should advisors start feeling about themselves? Yeah, this is really interesting. So, um, you know, in the coaching process, if you look at somebody's business, their business is, virtually a personification of themselves because it's created from the mind of the founder or the owner. So if you don't care for yourself, you don't look after yourself and you don't create awareness around what's holding you back, your limiting beliefs, there's no way you can go on and create a good business. So we've got this incredible swell of shame permeating throughout the industry to the point where it's literally taking lives. You know, we heard earlier that, you know, anecdotally, you know, 19 people had committed suicide in the financial advice space. To me, that's a, a dreadfully sad uh, statistic. And frankly, if I could help save one life, if someone's out there now feeling like this, reach out, get some help. Um, you know, ask for help. Don't be afraid. Don't feel ashamed to ask for help because that that step is the first step to recovering from whatever you're going through at the moment. And the other thing is that we build things up in our head to be bigger than they actually are. Um, 98% of what we worry about never happens. So there's a, there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of worry. The other thing that's not happening, and this bothers me the most, is that most clients are happy, to extremely happy, with their advisor and their relationship that they've got. 
So if you're an advisor listening to this, and there's going to be a variety of advisors, you could be an employed advisor, an owner advisor, or you could be running a large practice, or you could be employed by one of the large instos, start telling the good stories. Start promoting the good stories. Stop talking about your qualifications. Stop worrying about what other people are saying and focus on what you can change right now and tell the good stories. If you're spreading those good stories, the friends of those clients will want to hear the good stories as well and they're going to want a piece of it and they're going to want to become clients of yours as well. And communicate with them. Don't be quiet. The falling tree in the forest makes no noise, right? So get out there and make some noise, whether it's through your newsletter or whether it's some public speaking, engaging with your community or whatever it is. Go out there and tell the positive stories. What are you doing out there to change the world and to live your purpose? Don't hold back. I mean, you become an advisor for a reason. Think about what that reason is and go and tell people about it. Now, I don't mean go and tell them about it, why you became an advisor, because the whole why story thing is a load of bullshit. No client really wants to hear about that. What the clients want to hear about is, how you're going to help solve their problem, how you're going to bring about peace of mind to them so they don't have to worry about managing their money. They're not going to have to worry about their future. And that's what most financial advisors do. That's the business that they're in. They're in the peace of mind business. They're not in the, um, you know, get the best return business. If you think you're in that business, you're going to fade away, you're going to disappear and you're going to die a very fast death, particularly in the current environment. Um, So engage with your clients, um, take them on a journey and communicate that journey, that positive journey to other potential clients. And I think if advisors can do that, they're going to feel better about themselves and their business. The businesses are going to grow and their headspace is going to be far more positive. If you just focus on the negative, then that's that's what that's what you're going to manifest in your head. And in many ways, I believe that I manifested what happened to me in the Royal Commission. I believe that the chaos, the chaos and overwhelm that I had for a lot of the time where I was running my business is what helped manifest what brought about my participation in the Royal Commission. Um, you know, I have suffered from anxiety, debilitating anxiety in the past, where I literally didn't feel I could walk on to the Sky TV show. There were times where I literally couldn't walk up from the ferry to the city because I didn't want to sit or couldn't feel like I could sit in artificial air with artificial light in an artificial suit in front of an artificial relationship with a client because I didn't understand what my purpose was then with what I did. I hadn't fully connected with my business. It took me a couple of years or a few years to figure that out. Um, and that's why I started working from home and disconnecting from the office because I couldn't, I couldn't literally do it. Um, and I'm certainly not alone in that space. You know, if we look at, you know, I don't want to sort of focus on mental health. I don't think I was mentally unfit, but you know, I did have panic attacks where I couldn't come into the office literally. And, uh, and that for me, and this is what happened after the Royal Commission, I actually felt like that, uh, there was a disconnect between what I was doing and how I was doing it. But I look at the relationships of clients that I had. I've met with clients, quite a few clients between the Royal Commission and now, um, because I like them and I love them. And I knew their family. I've been to, you know, we've been through funerals and weddings and things together. That's the business that we're in. That's the relationship business. That's the important thing. Um, so my, my advice to other advisors is engage with your clients. Um, create relationships, deep relationships, and then tell those stories over and over about the value that you've added to those people's lives. And the, the question that I often ask now to my coaching clients, particularly on a Monday morning, is not what's happening, how are you going, where are your numbers? Monday mornings, how do you feel? Where's your head at? Because that's going to set the stage for the rest of the week. And you just see this immediate paradigm shift in how they operate. And they connect with their community. They become better people. They pay their taxes. They have successful businesses. And, you know, they just get this paradigm shift in what they're doing and how they're doing it. And again, that's what, you know, I would suggest advisors do is just think about and connect about the positive stories. Yeah, man. There's a, when it comes to marketing, um, content creation or, or, or solving the problem of what to talk about is something that's spoken about as if it's not an easy answer. It's actually a really, really easy answer in my opinion. And, and you absolutely just touched on it then. And that is talk about, write about, communicate how a client came in, this was their problem, and then they spoke to you and you implemented advice and now this is the solution. The client goes from unhappy to happy and you don't need to use names. You don't need to talk about product. You don't need to invent 
it's actually not a struggle. It's all you're doing is on your day to day job, almost like journaling what, mm. what, what your uh, successes are. And then communicating that, whether it's in a blog, whether it's in a LinkedIn, what I call LinkedIn posts is a mini blog. You get 1200 characters. Why can't you write it in there? I mean, Chris Bates, he is the killer at this, right? He's very, very, very good at micro using LinkedIn as a micro blogging, uh, service, which he does twice a day. Um, yeah, he, he does. Had, had coffee with him yesterday. Oh, really? He is, <laughs> uh, he's one of my favorite guys. Good guy. So, um, so one of the things that Emily, Blanche, head of community here at XY, and let's let's face it, she is XY. Um, she has just kicked off, and she's just figuring out how to do it, whether she does it on her own personal Instagram or whether she does it under the XY Advisor Instagram. But she wants to start telling these stories for advisors. If they're not going to tell them themselves, she has a oh, mate, they've lot. got to tell them themselves. They have I, to. Can, I, I, can I just give one, one shout out to advisors? Um, this is going to cost you twenty nine ninety five, or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But jump on Amazon, buy the book Story Brand, Brand Story, Story Brand by Donald Miller. Read it cover to cover, and then message me on LinkedIn. Tell me how freaking much it's going to change you and your business and what you do and how you do it. It's not about the advisors. A lot of advisors think, hey, you know, I'm I'm feeling insecure because I don't have this degree or I don't have this education or I haven't had these successes. The client doesn't care. The client's looking for comfort. The client's looking for a journey. They're looking for comfort and they're looking for peace of mind. That's really what it's all about. And it's the same thing that we all crave as human beings. What they really want is connection and reassurance. They want engagement. They want a relationship. That's what it's about. So when you're doing your website, don't go on about how well educated you are, or what you've, you know, what you've, what you've achieved. Um, sure, maybe have a little logo or a slogan or something like that, that that gives you some credibility but get your clients to tell the stories put your testimonials and your videos on there um, that's going to be really important talk to the client about the journey that you're going to take them on what they can expect um, and the problems that you're going to solve because when that client rings you or emails you for the first time or they're referred to you they're going to tell you not only what their problem is but how they're feeling that's what you need to focus on that feeling and we can be really several human beings being advisors. You know, I studied accounting. I got a, a degree, which I did finish, thank you, <laughs> uh, at the University of Western Sydney. And I'll post that online so you can all see it. Um, in uh, accounting and financial planning. And uh, yeah, pick yourself up on the ground now, mate. Um, I do actually have a sense of humor, weirdly enough. Uh, and, you know, we can be really several human beings, right? Hey, I've, I've done this. I've done that. I'm really smart. Come and see me. It's not what it's about. 100%. That's why telling stories about what you do for people is such an easy, it, 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 you don't even need to, like, I remember walking past, I went to FinCon, there was a sign at a door, it was like, how to, how to come up with ideas for, for content creation. Mm. And that was the first time that it was, it dawned on me that that was a hurdle for people who, mm. who were creating content was, oh, what am I going to write about? But then, I can't remember at what stage it dawned on me, but just how easy content creation is when you just simply write about what you do and how you help people. Mm. That is, you don't have to come up with six cool ways as to why just, Christmas trees purchased two months before Christmas at 50% off. No one cares. Exactly. Even if it's got all the SEO in there. I mean, just write about what you do for people. This is why I used to love my job because... So I, when I was in the media, there was two things I used to do. One was answering questions. So your money, your call was literally people ringing and asking questions. They immediately had a problem and I immediately could help them. I love that. When I had to start going to reading an auto queue because I, I became, you know, they, they got rid of that, uh, that structure, um, I struggled. I just felt like I was a voice like a, a mouthpiece and I yeah. felt anyone can do that. Any talking face can do that. That's, that's not a skill. I can't exercise my skill here. So I wasn't getting any personal satisfaction. And it was only towards the end that Sky, Sky News Business had changed that structure. I was fortunate enough still to get a, a Guernsey. So, you know, I was, I was happy to do that because I enjoyed being there, but I didn't have that same sense of engagement and contribution back to the community. So when people have a problem and I could help solve it, it's what I did with the AFR and actually went back and checked all my advice, by the way. Um, didn't find any problems, strangely enough. And, um, 
that's where I, I felt the value. And I think advisors will feel that they're adding more value if they've got that problem solving approach. You know, what, what's your problem? But what's your real problem? Understand yeah. the real problem is not getting a 5% return over a 3% return or getting 0.25 extra for cash. Just understand where your client's coming from. The best way to do that is, is simply to engage with them. And maybe, you know, take them out of the office, get the suit off and, and go and sit in a cafe and just find out what's going on in their lives. If a client's complaining or they've got problems going on, generally that's a projection of whatever's going on in their life. You know, it's no different from, from a Royal Commission. You know, what's going on in these people's lives to, to lead them to that point. And uh, I think there's an opportunity there for advisors to step into that space. Absolutely. And I think that's the that's why... I don't see um, advice ever being roboticized or automated. Um, Certainly not high-end advice. I mean, uh, I, you know, the robo-advice we're seeing out there is not advice at all. The robo-advice is, I don't even know why they call it robo-advice. It's just ro- robotic portfolio in, management. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> it's buying ETFs. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not, it's not robo even robo. Advice. Like it's no, yeah, it doesn't even rate. Um, not yet though. But I think the decision making capability. I, I see no uh, reason. I, why. I disagree with you here, man. Well, I see no reason why you can't build an algorithm that helps people make decisions you can, around you can, Centrelink or whatever. But they never. But people aren't going to be interested in using it. Correct. Yeah, they're not because because there's the, no engagement. Because what 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 people are really paying for is a framework. Which yes, a yes no tree can give you a framework. However. Uh, the day that um, people get psych, like psych help, psychological help from an app that says, hello, Clayton, how was your day today? And I go, oh, look, you know, blah, 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 blah. The day when the emotional connection between tech and the human supersedes the human to the human, I'll concede. But I, I just, a part of me says... You know what? After a couple hundred thousand years of being human, I'm going to want to continue speaking to a human about the things mm. that mean most to me mm. and not some algorithm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think, um, you know, part of the, you yeah, know, we've talked about it already, but you know, the, the core role of an advisor is to act, uh, and create a relationship and step them through a journey. And that requires discussion and understanding. And, uh, you know, for those people that do understand psychology and can connect with their clients on that level, they have a next level business. And I remember, um, as a gentleman that, uh, that came into my business from the industry, I won't describe who he was or where he's from, but he saw me saying goodbye to a client and he said, Sam, that was the warmest client interaction I've ever seen. And, you know, what am I, 40, 40, early 40s at the time, client would have been 70. Um, I didn't even think about it. Just walked back into the room. He said, mate, that's that was amazing. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> He's like, the way you engage with that client, I've never seen that before. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, oh, well, I don't think most advisors engage on that sort of level. You know, you gave her a hug goodbye and, uh, you know, you're talking about their kids and all of that. And I said, well, what's everyone else doing? <laughs> yeah. So I was quite fascinated with it because that's just how I like to engage on a on a human level. Um, so I don't know how you t- I don't know how you teach that stuff, mate. I don't know how you teach people to engage, but I know that there is a framework in StoryBrand that is is very helpful. And I think if we can at least start some education and discussion around this in the industry, it's going to take the industry to another level. The other noise in the background that's just going to be there. That's just something that we're all going to have to deal with you know as jim collins says you got to face the brutal facts um it is what it is and we've got to work our way through it or you got to work your way through it it's no longer us i'm not in it anymore but a few of my clients are and uh you know part of part of my job i suppose as a coach is to to guide them through that process in the best way possible and to you know duck and weave the bullets even when they come but also to take ownership and make the changes both in themselves and in their business and that's what it's all about yeah normalizing uh that's what advice is and does, I think, is a really good step. Mm. And that's what we try to do at XY um, is to say, you know, we're not your grandfather's advisor, right? Like mm. we, we, we are, we're here to show that you can be exceptional uh, in, in every sense of the word. Like how do you deliver the most advisor possible from uh, being a specialist at money? But money choices, life choices, life choices, money choices, they don't happen in a vacuum. You mm. have to be able to 
um, give people safety, security, aspiration. You have to be able to ask the, the most intricate questions that no one else has ever asked them and be able to do it in a way that doesn't make them uncomfortable and they mm. don't feel judged when mm. they answer. Because if you, if you say to someone, you know, uh, uh, do you want to invest in ethical investments? And they say, no, you have to do that in a way that does not make them feel like a bad person. If you can't mm. do that, then you, you don't have the right to be asking that question because your goal is to make them feel positive about their future. And if yeah. you can't do that, then all the other stuff is lost. Mate, I agree. Can I can I just do a, like a big rewind? Yeah. Um, one thing that I find that is really hard to deal with for advisors is the word perfection. We all deal with it. And in this world of social media where we're seeing perfect bodies on Instagram, we're seeing uh, people that make mistakes get slammed. The smallest of mistakes can turn into the biggest of problems. Um, perfection does not exist. We are human. We do make mistakes and we're not going to do anything perfectly. The advice process will never be perfect. It's actually an imperfect process because human relationships are imperfect. And if we take this to other professions, whether you're in law or whether you're in uh, medicine, perfection doesn't exist. And we've seen a lot of people cop a lot of crap in those other industries as well as our own industry because they're being upheld to a standard that cannot be upheld by a human being. And this is the problem of being human. It sucks, man. It yeah. sucks. We make mistakes. Yeah. And the first process that we have to go through when we make a mistake is owning it, but also letting yourself off. Just say, you know what, you made a mistake. It's time to move on. Um, don't sit there in a shame place. This is what's been taking lives. And this is where businesses are at at the moment. So even though you might not be um, have gone through anything like what I've ever been through or um, you know, you might think you've got a great business, either way, you're getting tainted with the you're a dodgy advisor brush. Every advisor is. Um, so again, it's just about forgiving yourself, forgiving the industry, and allowing yourself to move forward and look to the future about how you're going to build your business, how you're going to build your, your XY practice to be a best practice. You're never going to be a perfect practice. Don't ever think you're going to be a perfect practice. Don't ever put that expectation on yourself because you will make mistakes. But mistakes are how we learn. Mistakes are one of the most important things we, we do as human beings. You know, there's there's um, a bunch of experience. I'll try to remember the quote, but a man that makes no mistakes makes nothing at all. <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you're in your own business and you're listening to this podcast right now, you are expected to make mistakes. I teach my children to make mistakes. Go and break it. Go and make a mistake because that's how we learn. If you're going to be a perfect kid, you're going to suffer from debilitating anxiety and depression because you'll never live up to your own expectations. And exactly the same thing seems true for adults. You will make mistakes. Give yourself a break. Let yourself off and go and try to create the best you can do because I know that you're doing your best. So go and just do your best and accept that you will never be perfect. I've thought about this exact topic at length. Um, mostly because I make a hell of a lot of mistakes. No, no. <laughs> mostly because um, being a perfectionist, it's almost you wear it as a badge of honor, but it's actually, if you think about it, it's self-sabotage. Because um, if you expect perfection of yourself, then you won't do anything that won't achieve perfection. So you limit the amount of stuff that you're willing to even attempt to do mm. and being generous on yourself that you will make mistakes um, despite how scary the the consequences sometimes completely out of fucking proportion <laughs> um, it, it, despite yep. what those those potential uh, the side effects may be which we do live in a world of of side effects however you have to be strong enough to to push forward and that's why like when I, whenever I am asked to talk or speak or whatever about social media and stuff like that, um, I always try to get across the point that when you put yourself out there, your mum cares, your compliance person cares, 
and pretty much no one else and reduce what the effect that you feel you're going to have because Mm -hmm. everyone else is paying attention to their own shit. And if you write something and if you put a spelling mistake in there, God forbid, or if you write something that's a little bit dorky, God forbid, because you're feeling a little bit awkward about doing it, so what? So, so what? what? Do you know how many, how many lawyers? You know, I've spoken to a bunch of lawyers, and you know sometimes they will say, "Okay, in this particular point, my response to you is, so what? <laughs> it happens. So what? It's no big deal. Everyone fucks up." One thing that um, Brene Brown writes, and this is a really important uh, point to make to anyone out there that is uh, suffering either from shame or mental illness, anxiety, depression, whatever it might be, you know, my call out to you guys would be um, something that Brene Brown says about shame. And again, this is in the context of what I am seeing an industry enshrouded in shame at the moment is that there's only one way to get rid of shame and that's to share it, to share shame, to step out of that, to, to, to step out of the ownership of shame, share it with somebody and it can't survive. If you give it air by keeping it inside you, you will never get rid of it. And people carry it around all their lives, all their lives. And there's an opportunity that you have, and it takes a huge amount of courage and a stretch for an individual to do this. But to own that takes you out of shame entirely. It allows you to take your first step. And if you look at programs like um, AA or uh, you know men's retreat that I went on or things like that, it's about taking ownership but it's about sharing as well because when i told my story at the men's retreat and you know we ended up doing this incredible processing uh of not only my issue but a lot of other people's issues there the person facilitating it and there was 50 60 people in the room they said has anyone here ever walked the line the thin line of integrity everyone put their hand up everyone so it just goes to show that we're not perfect in what we do but if we share that shame we talk about it if we open it up you know xy community it's one one good thing about xy it's a community man never in financial advice or probably in any industry have we seen the level of engagement that you guys get on social the the comments the uh the the sharing the collaboration it's insane and one thing that i've always done throughout um my career, be it in, in financial services or outside even coaching now, is I've always been collaborative. I'm happy to talk to anyone about anything and tell them anything and being transparent about what I do and how I do it. Because if they're going to go and steal it, and I use that term steal in inverted commas, if they're going to go and use that, they're going to apply it in a different way. There's actually nothing to be scared of by sharing. And it's the same thing with shame. When you share it, and this is where the Me Too movement became so big, because people shared what happened Mm. they stepped into that place of courage and stepped over the shame and they said me too Mm. fuck really that's happened to you as well man me too me too me too me too there's a movement around it and it's the same in financial advice it's fascinating i think there's a lot of advisors out there that especially um amp right now because of what's happened with you know uh, a whole business model has been predicated on a four times multiple and then they've said actually maximum 2.5 now there's a class action going through and you know that uh, from what i can tell it looks they look confident but there are funders there are multiple um, lawyers looking at, at but that's going to be a journey and a process and that's going to take years right it's going to be huge um it's ugly in the meantime there's going to be a lot of individual advisors men and women out there who have purchased companies um, who now own a larger amount of debt than they do asset. Maybe not all of them are in that position, but certainly they're expecting X X dollars at retirement and now they're less, you know, uh, 50%. Mm. Um, There's going to be a lot of shame around that. What I've found interesting is I haven't seen much come from AMP advisors about this. Well... From my experience in dealing with lawyers, they just tell you to be quiet. That this explains is a lot. Half the problem. So, whilst we would encourage discussion and sharing and collaboration, 
uh, in an adversarial environment like you just described, no one is going to talk probably from here on because they've probably all been told to shut up because it could affect the uh, the outcome. Um, it is a really sad example because you've got a company that's completely changed its stance on its own people, a public company, who you've got to realise and understand that their number one focus is their shareholders. That's all they're focusing on, not their staff or their advisors. Uh, but that's a sad place to be as well, right? Like we look at it and we just, you know, sure we've known that's been in place. I mean, you and I have heard that being spoken around the traps for 10, 15, 20 years. There's people that have bought and sold businesses based on that bowl of being in place. So, you know, there's people that are picking up an arbitrage. Oh, well, I can buy it one and a half or two times, so I've got a guarantee here at four times. I'm home and hose, man. I'm just going to keep this little thing going and I'm going to keep plugging it out. Um, unfortunately, that's now flawed and, and under question. So, listen, I, I can't really comment on it too much apart from saying I think it's a it's a sad thing when something so obvious... Um, to a lot of people has now changed and the carpet has certainly been pulled under pulled from under their feet um but you know like like any huge amount of change uh, try to see the positive in it try to push through it um seek some help seek some advice talk to people share your share your uh, uh share your story um and just try to talk it out and deal with it in the best way possible again it's about facing the brutal facts you can't you're not going to deny it if you're in the if you're at the front line. Um, just try to step your way through it in the best way possible and reach out to people who you think might be able to help. Get some mentorship, um, you know, w- whatever you can. Get some support. I think support in this sort of area for advisors is just so important. For any advisor that's gone through um, either complaints or or issues, support is so important. And frankly, I don't think it's going to come from you your association if you think they're going to be there to back you up you know you got to think twice but um you know look for a a mentor look for uh, some peers and you know some some peer groups out there that'll give you that support really important yeah well mate um there's there's a bunch a bunch of uh, advisors um that i have looked at over the years yourself peter donatidis um andrew rocks poor man um, that I have just looked at over the years and, and sort of, you know, how do I make advice valuable and, and, uh, and appropriate to, to the, the client? Um, shifting tact a little bit, I want to jump back into ASIC for one second because ASIC, in a lot of ways, came to the rescue very recently in terms of FASIA. I'm not, now I know that I'm not sure if you're keeping up to date with this entirely, but, um, uh, FASIA are you know, attempting to sort of codify in law an ethics uh, a guideline, which is a pretty, pretty like groundbreaking in that not, that doesn't really exist anywhere. Apparently it exists somewhere else in the world with a profession. Mm. I assume it's probably the UK. I assume it's probably financial advice. I don't know, but it's kind of groundbreaking. And, and in doing so, it's obviously creating a lot of, a lot of upheaval for, for advisors because they're just looking at the whole thing going, wow, there's, there's, there's a bunch of legal problems for me here. ASIC put their hand up and said, look, we're going to help fill in some gaps. I'm looking at this document in front of you and they've said, um, the, the, the minimum I can give you for a ban, I, I want to give you the minimum. Um, and reading sort of in there about, they don't think you were being misleading. And, and like there was a lot of claims which then ASIC have turned around and said actually don't represent reality and they've still stung you on a draft piece of advice, but let's not go there. Um, so, um, <laughs> allegedly. Yes. Allegedly. So, um, so uh, ASIC, from looking at this document in front of me, from looking at what they've done publicly, they've actually s- said even recently that it's going to be hard to be able to uh, – uh, deliver advice to many as many people that are going to require it. Mm. Now, are we seeing potentially ASIC looking like they are becoming more favourable to advisors? Is the, or am I just out there on a limb? <laughs> it's an interesting point that you make there, and I would certainly love it if ASIC did take on that role. If you look at the terms of reference, though, for what ASIC, you know, what their objectives are as a body. 
It is to enforce the corporation's law and the... the so they're never going to be buddy-buddy. Um, they say they're never going to be buddy-buddy. But again, I think it would be much more proactive and helpful and collaborative if they were uh, a lot more open to discussion because it's their problem as well. Uh, yeah, it's a good they were brought up. They were brought up at the Royal Commission to say that they're not... Uh, they're, they're not litigating enough. So they start litigating, they lose the first three cases. Yeah. So this is their problem as well. You know, what that, what's that going to look like? Um, so, and again, this was, a, I suppose, a challenge of the Royal Commission. They come in and they poo-poo everybody. They take down the associations, the regulators and the advisors and the banks and the instates. Everyone goes down. They're all lying <laughs> face down on the canvas. One of them opens one eye and they go, Fuck. <laughs> What do we do? Yeah, yeah. How do we do with this? Okay, how do you do with it? Okay, everyone's fired. Um, we're going to hire a bunch of new people. We're going to put them all in place. We're going to blame everyone that's just been fired, and we're going to try to come to a solution. And the new people come in and go, oh, wow, that was a shit fight. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start remediating, and you know, if it's grey, we're going to pay, and if it's this and it's that, we're all going to try to do the right thing and all be friends here. Mate, it's not working. They, they, they probably shouldn't have gone and fired everybody in the first place because they're the one that had all the intellectual property. They, the people that they fired probably should have said, hey, you know, we screwed up. I'm sorry. Um, these are the changes we're going to bring about and we're going to overhaul the industry. We're going to overhaul our advice process. This is what our SOAs are going to look like. This is what our client journey is going to look like. This is what our customer experience looks like. And it's all going to be compliant and we're going to work with ASIC. We're going to work with the government and we're going to make a universal solution, right? Wouldn't that be lovely? I don't understand why that's not possible. Yeah. I don't understand why everyone's, you know, just gone into this huge flap and they're throwing arrows everywhere. And the only people that are, that are winning are the uh, $3 trillion that's been spent on, or $3 billion, I should say, that's been spent on legal fees. The lawyers are loving this. This is fantastic. Yeah. They're rubbing their little hands together. They're taking new floors on different uh, city buildings here, having a wonderful time throwing arrows at each other. What a, what a great time, but not very constructive. And at the end of the day, who's losing out? The people that need the financial advice, the customers, the clients, they're the ones that need the advice. This is who it should all be about. So why aren't we sitting in focus groups, talking to them, asking them what they want and the best way that they're going to understand the process rather than fighting amongst the, the lawyers about how you're going to, you know, what terminology you're going to use and what the legislation is going to look like. Um, let's start with a client. Put the client first. One of the... It's kind of ironic, really, that we're all talking about best interest duty, and I've been pinged for it. And frankly, just about anyone that's going to be hauled over the coals and using a ten year look back is going to struggle to 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 fight any best interest duty. Um, let's just put the client first and just see what they've got to say, and how do we put it in terms that they're going to understand and give them the advice that they need. Well, I think probably the best terms to use are the seven steps to safe harbour. Yeah, <laughs> I remember you got asked that question on the stand. They go, uh, the seven steps to safe harbor, Sam Anderson. Do you know what that is? And you go, uh, yeah, like I've heard of it. <laughs> like, because, because, you know, when it came out, it was, but essentially we just wrapped it up and called it best interest duty. You know that, uh, that emoji that's got the palm to the forehead? <laughs> I'm just doing that right now. Um, cool. I, I actually knew the, quote from uh the corporations act but i didn't i'd not heard the safe harbor i've not heard it in that term at the time and i thought oh my god you idiot um so had you gone hey you know section 970 whatever it was um you know different story but listen most advisors probably don't no that that was the hilarious Let's face it. that was the like i just summarize it as seven steps to essentially get to the best interest duty that, yeah. in my mind that's what it was it just did it but that that I was just commenting on the fact that we do focus so much on that terminology and this sort of stuff mm, rather mm. than, hey, client, what do you want out of life? Mm, mm. You know? That's the challenge, mate. That's a challenge the industry's got. It's going to go on for a while yet. So buckle in, guys, and, uh, you know, let's hope you can weather the storm because uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. But one thing that won't uh, also change is the fact that clients need advice. They need you guys as advisors and they need you to take them on a journey. Uh, and they need you to make you guys feel, make them feel better about that journey and about their, you know, managing their money. It's what it's all about. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really, really appreciate it. It's, this has been one of uh, the interviews that I've been most excited about doing in my whole like career of podcasting. Um, in the event 
that you were are open to having advisors reach out. Uh, what is the best way to go about that? Uh, I will have a new website going live in the new year, samhendo.com, no AU, uh, or on LinkedIn. Talk to me on LinkedIn, guys. Like I'm, I pretty much respond to most messages. I think you probably find I'm pretty down to earth sort of dude. What you might have heard or seen out there, uh, is, is, you know, not who I am, pretty casual sort of guy. Um, I enjoy talking to people and, you know, hopefully you can add some value along the way. Awesome, man. Thanks again. Been a pleasure, Clayton. Thanks for having me. Back.